We have St. Augustine watching from North Africa as his beloved Rome, where he studied, he's a great uh, product of classical civilization, is sacked. And he responds by averting his gaze from this world and writing the city of God. He, mm -hmm. he, he, he shifts his, his attentions to heaven. Mm -hmm. A few decades later, we have St. Benedict of Nursia up in northern Italy. And he's the founder of great monasteries, attempting to hoard, in a certain sense, what, what learning he can and hoping that later there will be regrowth. And he adopts a motto which translates from the Latin, to pruned it will grow again. So is Tom Sowell an Augustine who's <laughs> insisting on underlying principles and a kind of eternal values, but actually foresees, believes that what he is observing is total collapse? Mm. Or is he a Benedict hoping for, preparing for, doing what he can to initiate rebirth? Well, I, I'm in an age where I, I couldn't play either of those roles. <laughs> you look pretty saintly to me, Tom. <laughs> you need new glasses. <laughs> but, but, but uh, no, I, I, I think it was really, uh, but what I meant about the, the pathetic aspect of the uh, aftermath of the collapse of Rome, is, you know, the, these heroic efforts, which, which ultimately paid off, you know, many centuries later, but they were centuries to live through. Imagine, yeah, well, the dark ages were dark. Yes, imagine living in the midst of ruins that you don't even have the knowledge to repair, much less to build. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's what you mean in the passage when you talk about the pathetic attempt to yes. rebuild among the ruins. Yes. The sense that there was a civilization here. And it was all around you. And this is, I think this is part of the reason that the Europe of that, of that era is th thought of as a backward-looking civilization. They had good reason to look backwards because the people before them had achieved far more than they were capable of achieving or even sustaining. Mm. So your fear is that t two decades from now, Americans will be looking back at, re even at the 1950s, a time of growth and American self-confidence and standing up to the Soviets in the Cold War, assuming a large role in the world, that'll be gone and we'll have the feeling that we're pygmies by comparison with... Th there's something of this in Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. Yes. There's a kind of nostalgia, a feeling that those who came just before us were bigger people somehow. Mm -hmm. They were. They were. You... Yes. All right. Um, last question. If you could offer one sentence of counsel to the President of the United States, what would you say, Tom? Resign. <laughs> no, I can't end the program on that. If you could offer one sentence of counsel to some 20-year-old kid who's watching this webcast, mm -hmm. and by the way, when, when we put up a notice that you're going to appear on Twitter or Face, you are a rock star to college kids. I want you to know that. So there's, 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 there's hope. You're, 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 you're reaching people. So one sentence of advice to some sophomore or junior who's watching this today and, and thinks to himself, gee, Dr. Sowell just told me the America in which I'm going to grow up will be a shrunken place. No, no. Uh, it's, it's not over till it's over, as Yogi Berra said. And uh, I, I would say to this young person, if we, through some miracle, get through this, please take to heart the lesson of what happens when you vote on the basis of uh, rhetoric and symbolism and instead of using your mind. Uh, it doesn't matter how smart you are unless you stop and think. Uh, another source of conflict in the world, uh, sometimes, as we've mentioned, uh, drawn along racial or ethnic lines, is poverty. Uh, what, what are the true causes of poverty as you have been able to, to discern them in your study of the world in a, in a comparative way? I'm afraid that I haven't even looked for the causes of poverty. I, I regard poverty as just simply the absence of wealth. So what I look for are the things that cause wealth to occur. I don't believe that there's any particular reason why everyone in the world would in fact have the same wealth. Uh, there are certain peculiar circumstances that have arisen in a few countries on the face of the earth and only relatively recently in human history that has made the kind of affluence that exists in the United States or Western Europe or Japan uh, commonplace in these countries. So what I'm interested in is what peculiar set of circumstances have caused that to come about. 
Uh, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that people ought to be asking that question and not the question of poverty. Everyone is born poor and ignorant. To the extent that people become different, we have to find out what are the things that enable them to become different and how can those opportunities be more widely generalized. Well, you have written that in order to be a partisan of the poor, you must at first uh, be a partisan of the truth. What then do you think gets close to being at the truth of, of the sources of wealth generation? What, what creates wealth? Oh, skills, uh, traits of human beings of one sort or another, um, discipline, organization, uh, entrepreneurship. Again, there's not the slightest reason to expect these various factors, and there are many, many others, obviously are ever going to be randomly distributed. Every single group has its own history, it has its own uh, geographic setting in which it developed and so on. It would be an absolute miracle if all these factors were the same uh, across groups. And nowhere in the world do we find them even approximately the same. Uh, the difference in income between blacks and whites in the United States, for example, is very commonplace around the world. It's about the same as the difference between uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazic Jews in Israel. Uh, it's smaller than the difference between Chinese and Malays in Malaysia. It's much smaller than the difference between East Indians and Africa in East Africa. Uh, and you could go on and on down through history and around, around the world. Nowhere do I find this even distribution of income or the even distribution of people in occupations or in institutions that people talk about as sort of a norm that would exist if there were no institutional discrimination. Is there a way for you to put it in a nutshell about what people of, say, your own race mm. say about you that they don't like what you say oh, about Oh, wait, wait. Uh, I, think, I think one of the, one of the ways that the uh, organized noisemakers have succeeded is saying that what they're saying is what their race is saying. My race is not saying that about me. Those particular individuals who are a small minority of themselves within the black community, who have a vested interest in many of these programs, they are saying that. But when I checked out of my hotel this morning, you know, the black uh, uh, security guard kind of came over and said, are you soul? And I said, yes, and he shook my hand warmly and we walked me, he walked me the length of the corridor and talked about this and about that. And that's not at all an uncommon experience for me. So it's not soul versus blacks, it's the black intellectuals. And the black intellectuals are no more typical of the black population than white intellectuals are of the white population. Uh, but they have a very large vested interest in certain beliefs which, which underlie various programs from which they benefit enormously. And as I point out in the book, this is common around the world, that the elites benefit from preferential programs, even when those programs are in the name of the masses. The masses do not benefit. In the case of the current so-called Civil Rights Act, the masses are going to lose big if that law goes into effect. Why? Because employers will not want to hire as many blacks in the jobs for which most blacks will be applying. Because those will not be jobs as rocket scientists or as doctors or, as any, or any of those things. And therefore, they'll want to hold down percentages down there uh, to what they can do uh, in the higher ranks, which is going to be much less. Uh, and so, you, so you're sacrificing the working class blacks for the benefit of the professional elite. How do the intellectual elite, both white and black, get to the position that they do in this country that you disagree with? I mean, how, how do they have the influence they have? Well, no, but how, what, what, what's their, th from what your discussions over the years, what's their thought process that gets them there? Is it emotion or is it fact? Emotion largely, but also a large amount of self-interest, increasingly self-interest. I think that if you went back, you know, into the 60s, you'd find people with different views like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. But I think that both those men believed in what they said. Uh, whereas today, you have people who are simply professional hustlers. And again, this is not peculiar to blacks or peculiar to the United States or even peculiar to racial issues. That organizations typically, many movements are set out by idealistic people who want to promote some good for mankind or for some group. But as time goes by and as they succeed, they'll be followed by people who can use these things for their own self-interest. And that's been the history of regulatory agencies in the government. Uh, it's been the history of, I think, of, uh, of religions, that the, uh, the first Christians who were being persecuted by the Roman Empire were not in it, you know, for what they could get because all they were going to get is trouble. But once Christianity became the state religion, this became a very lucrative career for some people. Uh, and then you get an entirely different kind of person coming in at that point and we can have an entirely different kind of movement. You, you assault it head on. You describe it as a barrier to progress and a lot of other things. Explain why multiculturalism, if you would, is bad. I guess it starts from a false premise, uh, which is that there's something uh, 
that, that all that all cultures are equal in some undefinable sense which has never been the case I mean some cultures are better at some things worse at other things uh, and at particular part times in history uh, one group's culture may be ascendant and another time in other groups but what you almost never see is what they assume is a norm, namely all groups performing pretty much the same in all kinds of fields across the board. That you, you, you can go through centuries of history without finding a single example of that. You, you say that that assumption in fact holds different groups down. You write, quote, multiculturalism like the caste system paints people into the corner where they happen to have been born, but at least the caste system doesn't claim to benefit those at the bottom. A absolutely. So when the multiculturalists say, for example, that uh, the school should not try to uh, uh, make uh, black students uh, speak standard English, uh, the difference between speaking standard English and not speaking standard English can be huge in terms of your, your job, your careers, and all sorts of other things. Well, uh, yeah. Uh well, one of the things that happens is people, uh, some, some gatherings, they introduce me and say how, how I came out of Harlem and went on to professional careers, if that was something extraordinary. And a few years ago, uh, a black lawyer in Harlem wrote to me, from Harlem, I don't think he was in Harlem anymore, uh, saying that uh, he grew up in Harlem and uh, gave the address, it was about two blocks from where I grew up, saying, you know, really, that was not that unusual in that era. And he proceeded to list the... Uh, I think it was something like a, a, a priest, or two lawyers, a college president, etc., who all came out of this one building, this one tenement that he lived in. And as I thought back over, uh, I, I realized that was really not that unusual in that era. That uh, I lived uh, within a oh within about a five block radius of 145th Street and Saint Nicholas Avenue in Harlem. And within that radius. I can remember a kid whom I played with who went on to become the dean of one of the colleges, has recently retired. Another, a half a block away, who recently retired as a psychiatrist. I'm the only one who's still working from this cohort. <laughs> uh, a half a block away also lived Harry Belafonte. And five blocks the other direction was James Baldwin. And uh, again, within the same radius at the same time, uh, Colin Powell went to college there. So it was not at all that unusual in that time. Part of the reason was that people were able to get a decent education in the school system, which they cannot get today in that same place. Uh, I, I went, um, I had my niece who lives in Harlem tell me the name of the math textbook that her kids were using in the 11th grade. I got myself a copy to see what they were doing. And the next time I talked with her, I said, you know, what they're teaching your kids in the 11th grade is what they taught me in the 9th grade. So that's where the educational system is. So that a kid who lives in that same block that I or that lawyer lived in no longer has the same opportunity that we had because the education system has been destroyed. There's a great deal of uh, self-congratulation in some liberal circles because of all the things that have been done for blacks. But if you destroy the family, law and order, and education, there is nothing else you can do that will make up for it. Basis for social policy. What's this about? It's about the mindset of uh, many of the people in academia and the media, among the media el elite and in politics. And particularly those who think that uh, various solutions should be imposed from the top down on the way people live, live their lives. Why do you think they feel that way? You'd have to ask them that. Uh, I, I think that they, they think they're just so much smarter than other people that uh, we're going to be so much better off if they tell us what to do or if they lead us in the, in the, into doing things, such as recycling. I've seen a couple of studies indicating that recycling is at best useless. Uh, I've seen uh, numbers that say that uh, uh, aluminum is something like 14% of the uh, Earth's crust, uh, yet we're recycling aluminum. Uh, that uh, we're re recycling glass, which comes mostly from sand, and the Sahara Desert alone is larger than the continental United States. Uh, they talk about trees, that uh, you know, the original stand of trees is gone. I tell them the original stand of people is gone. But uh, somehow we keep regenerating. Are the Republicans or the Democrats better or worse at this? You mean... Top-down... Uh, 
Well, well, uh, well a certain wing of the Democratic Party, of course, has made its career on this over the last 30 some years. What about the Republicans? As, you, but, as you've seen them in this 1995 year, what, what kind they, of... They seem to be trying to dismantle what the Democrats have done. How are they doing? Well, it'll take, you have to wait another 30 years to see how, how well they've done it. The Democrats didn't do it in a day. What sparked this particular book for you? I guess, um, in a sense, getting tired of arguing the same arguments in different guises over and over on issue after issue and realizing there's a certain underlying pattern of beliefs, assumptions about the world, about people, uh, and that what we really need to do is look at some of those assumptions and the kinds of conclusions they lead to. And more than that, um, the extent to which that mindset is resistant to empirical evidence. I went to the University of Chicago as a Marxist after a year of of uh, studying under Milton Friedman, I was still a Marxist. But the uh, one summer of working in the government was enough to uh, turn, start, start returning around. Really, what happened to you there? Well, nothing happened to me, but that I realized that the government was n nowhere close to being capable of doing what people on the left wanted the government to do. And that, in fact, we'd be lucky if they didn't make things worse. For example, I was in the Labor Department, and uh, they administered the minimum wage law. Uh, to me, the question was, did minimum wage laws make poor people better off or worse off? Mm -hmm. That was not the question for them. The minimum wage law provided one third of their to total budget. And they weren't going to look at this in, in this other way. And as I tried to get into the question, of, does this cause unemployment and stuff like that, uh, there was no enthusiasm whatsoever for that whole line of, uh, you know, empirical evidence does matter. It does. I see less of it than you do. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to believe that because you've said so. I've, I've been asking you for it and I haven't gotten any of it. So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to agree uh, with you on that. But so, uh, we have one minute. The major piece of empirical evidence that I think you've cited uh, this hour has really been the contrast between the 60s and the 70s. And no, I, it's been the contrast I between well-off people and, poor, and, and badly off people. And that's true in other countries as well, that in Malaysia, where they've had affirmative action for the same amount of time, it's had the same results. It has done nothing for the poor Malays. The lowest level of Malays receive a smaller percentage of all the income received by Malays today than before this program, than before this program was put into effect as is true of blacks in the United is States. Is it worthless to do something for anybody but the very poor? I would like to see the well-off take care of themselves. If they can't, who can? Even Thank you very much. <clears throat> no, I, I would agree with that, but you would also have to agree that generally speaking, women are paid less, for example, for the same jobs as men. No, I would not. I would not agree with that. If you're talking about women, with the same number of years of experience, with the same continuous service, et cetera, et cetera, then when I look at that, I don't find that disparity. I find, for example, in many cases, the women are making more, depending upon how you break the data down. The difference with women is between, unmar is between married women and everybody else. That's the real difference. Well, even as to single women, the Census Bureau statistics, the most recent ones I could find, 1978, say that single men are earning $11,100 and single women are earning $9,300. Yes, I, lo I love the word single that is used. When I did my study, I didn't use single, I used never married. You see, a woman who is single at age 40, having spent 10 or 20 years raising children, is really not quite the same as a man of age 40 who's been working continuously for 20 years. And, and the differential she cited is not that great, so it could easily be accounted for by, by, by the Yes, because raised. when I break them down the other way, I, I did this for the academic world, and there I found the uh, women who are never married, which is the term the way I, I take it, uh, there they were earning more than the men. And similarly, when the government did data some years ago on women who had been working continuously since high school into, the thir into their, their 30s, uh, there you found that they were making slightly more than men of the same description. So the difference is between married women and everybody else. And married men get an extra bonus because their wives take care of many things that enable them to put more time into their careers. I'm sure you're aware of the fact. Against this background of historic issues about the very meaning of law, it is both ironic and appalling that Judge Bork's own record is being judged on a myopic basis of an issue-by-issue -issue statistical box score on how he has allegedly voted for or against one class of litigants or another, as if he liked chemical companies more than he liked pregnant women, or liked asbestos manufacturers better than he liked bereaved widows. Surely no responsible person thinks that this is what law is all about. Yet such shrill propaganda from special interest groups is repeated in respectable quarters as if the statistics represented some objective fact. 
Many people have no idea how utterly worthless and therefore deceptive such statistical box scores can be. Last year this time in California, there was a bitter election campaign over the re-election of the state chief justice. During that campaign, one side uh, cited statistics to show that the chief justice had voted for defendants 85 percent of the time over a period of nearly a decade. The other side, using exactly the same raw statistical data for exactly the same span of years, concluded that the chief justice had voted for the prosecution nearly 90 percent of the time. Well, these are not small differences, either in terms of numbers or implications. Uh, neither were they based on any esoteric statistical uh, methods. All that they depended upon were differences in definition as to what was a vote for the prosecution. The statistics thrown around recklessly as to how Judge Bork has allegedly voted against women X percent of the time or for some other class of litigants Y percent of the time are no more reliable than the definitions used by the special interest sources from which they come. Arbitrary definitions are no less arbitrary when they are expressed in numbers rather than words. Taking these box scores seriously reflects either a dangerously naive gullibility about statistics or an even more dangerously cynical view of the truth. The same kind of box score approach has been used against Jug Bork in the racial area, except that all the things Mr. Bork has done to advance the civil rights of blacks and Asians are either ignored or played down, while every legal question he has raised about any portion of any civil rights law or court decision has been automatically defined by his critics as being anti-civil rights or anti-black. Obviously, I wouldn't be here if I believed any of that.